So how old were you when you came to America? I was 17. 19 years old. I was 18 years old. And where did you come from? I came from the uh, Saca Navarra. T ten kids in the family. Nine brother or sister, you know, uh, was pretty hard to make a living, you know. And I, I, I saw them people come, on, you know, for the United States. Say, well, I'm gonna try it. I sent papers, you know. Uh, they told me when I went to sign the passport in Bilbao, Spain. They told me you going to Wyoming. Here I was three months later. I became shipper. <laughs> In a place best known for cowboys and open spaces, the Basques have added a unique aspect to Wyoming's cultural landscape. As early as the beginning of the last century, people of Basque descent have been coming from their homelands along the Spanish-French border to the mountains and plains of Wyoming to work, most often as sheep herders. Their festive costumes and dances seen here at the North American Basque Festival in Buffalo, Wyoming, are in stark contrast to their lonely existence on the range. We flew Paris to Colorado, uh, Colorado to Sheridan. It was about seven o'clock at night. I have my name on, the, on my chest, you know. We go in the store, uh, I buy all of my clothes, my bed, everything I need for shipper. After we, we go in the mountains. After over 40 years, Raymond is going back to those mountains in the Bighorn Range where he first herded sheep when coming to the U.S. What was the first thing you thought when you got to this area in Wyoming? Well, I was pretty shocked, you know, how big they were, they were in the mountains, you know, they was huge, you know. It was wonderful. I, I like it. The first stop is a shipping pen where sheep were loaded onto trucks and shipped down out of the mountains before winter. In the spring, the newborn lambs were docked and branded with paint, then driven into the mountains to graze for the summer. The trip makes a pit stop at the cabin of Basque herder and cattleman Tony Rodriguez. Here, Tony still spends his summers. This is my bed. That's your bed. <laughs> but when I'm not here, anybody can sleep on it. <laughs> <laughs> my pain pay also go there too, and I got everything in there. Wait, 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 I never eat any old meat. <laughs> Be, vegetables yeah. and all that. Tony explains how he cooks the old fashioned way. Yeah, only very good. Okay. Put it in there. Like it was the match. Cook something in the oven. This to, to shut the so the heat don't go out. And this is for a roast. If I want to cook a leg of lamb, and then I, I usually cook in the evening. And I go outside and have a drink. You're a little one over. You have another one. You have another one. <laughs> and by, uh, by the time uh, by the time the the leg is cooked. I'm in bed. <laughs> the cabin has no plumbing, so Tony gets his water from a mountain spring nearby. I don't know if it's any now or not. See? See? Do you have to filter the water out of the spring, or you just, just kind of clean it? Just clean it. Just yes. clean it, okay. See, uh, if you go like that with your hand, the water cleans out right away, see? Yeah. He used to run spring water to an old cooler as a makeshift refrigerator. See? Yeah. Tony explains how elk provide evening entertainment. The cows, the cows, they go inside and play. And I go over there with my glass of wine and watch them over there for a while. Then the uh, little calves, they come alongside because they're too little to jump yet. And uh, they come and uh, start hauling the mommy. They go, eat, 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 eat. The elk. What was the hardest part of it? The hardest part? It wasn't the work. The work is easy work. I mean, it's no work is the loneliness. I mean, you you by yourself over there, nobody, the the ranchers uh, come and see you maybe twice a week, mm -hmm. or maybe sometimes once a week. Yeah. I never write so many letters. I I used to write, uh, probably 
twice a week or, or three times a week, a letter home, you know. I, just, I had one time, one time my boss told me, Tony, how come, how come you write so many letters? I mean letters. They said, well, I ain't got nothing else to do. We leave Tony's cabin and head higher into the Bighorn Range. What was the most difficult thing? Winter time. Winter, I don't like it in the winter. It was too cold in the wind. It was terrible. You know, sometimes come down the 35, 35 or 40 below zero, you know, I tell you. I was living in a cookhouse, you know. And I tell you, it was so cold, you know, sometimes in the morning everything was tossed. In the cookhouse, or sheep wagon, is where many herders lived on the range. Although now adopted as an unofficial symbol of Basques in Wyoming, many people don't fully appreciate just how far from civilization these houses on wheels could be parked. What was it like in those sheep camps? Oh, it's kind of hard because you don't have nobody around. But then we had the radio, listen to the radio, night. What would you like to listen to? Oh, we used to listen sometimes from a, one station from Mexico because they speak Spanish. Yeah. And they kind of enjoy their music and stuff like that. And they, from London, they give them news and all that stuff in Spanish and I kind of like it. Tony describes how he personalized his sheep wagon. I car inside the wagon we had a little, right above the bed we had a little shelf and right underneath I wrote my name the day I come to, to Buffalo and the year I come to Buffalo in the hour I remember I remember it, it's been almost 42 years two o'clock in the afternoon Oh. Island in Sheridan, Wyoming. Carving and graffiti were common practices of many sheep herders. In addition to shearing pens, tree carvings called arbor glyphs are also common. If you are a less good driver, less thing, less good driver, just keep poking the stuff out. But you have to do it real thin. Because if you, you do it too white, when it start, the tree starts going, it starts spreading. See, if you uh, make it real thin, then you still can see it. The ones that got the uh, S1, uh, one of them is uh, 1800 and some over there, and you still can see on the tree. The last leg of Raymond's pilgrimage leads up a very bumpy road into the timbers, past the site of an old gold mining camp. Here an open shaft can still be seen. Finally, we arrive at Raymond's place. The only thing that marks the site is a spring where Raymond would get his water. Good, fresh water. Mm. You can see some shiny, it looks like a gold right here to look at that. Yeah. Look at yeah. We asked Raymond what he missed about this lonely little spot. Here in the summer. Yeah. I miss in the summer here. Yes. It's beautiful. I love it. You can do fishing and the. You can do pretty much anything you want, it's nice. It's not too hot, it's not too cold. You get up, it was nice, clear, everything, uh, very peace and quiet, and uh, very safe. Tony stops to get one last drink before we leave and go to the Basque picnic. This site is also high in the mountains, and like Tony's cabin, it also has an outhouse. The Basques seem totally at home cooking lamb and freshly caught trout. They play a traditional card game called Moose and actually speak in Basque. The trek to Raymond's camp is marked by reminders of how life on the range is changing. From the increasing number of fences to the use of electricity where it's never been before and even the way llamas now guard flocks alongside traditional sheepdogs. Some are concerned about the fate of the Basque culture, as more of them adopt new ways and a new language in a changing landscape. Yeah, I, I go back home in 2003. I love it too. I stay, I go for three weeks. Yeah, I stay two weeks. Uh, you know what? Mm. I was ready to come back. Really? Yes. Does well, this feel like home now? Yeah, that's my home. I got my, my wife, my family, everything here, grandkids, you know, uh, that's my home.
66, I came to this in this country. I thought, well, if you're going to live in this country, so I'll come, become citizen. Tony talks about recording the past on an aspen tree. Every year since I came to this country, I got my all the years in that tree, same tree. Really? Yes. Uh, right now, uh, right now, is a lot of trees over there that fell down, and there was a lot of bad names in it. You know, a wind, a wind came up and just, and I told, I told my kids, uh, if ever something happened to me, you just go up there, cut the tree and take it home. But you know what happened after you do that? It died. The bark it peels up, and then that's it. You know. When the, uh, when the tree is alive, that's when you see it. If yeah. it died, then it's gone. What Tony says seems to be metaphoric of the potential fate of Basque culture in the U.S. As Basques in Wyoming adopt a new language and a new culture, the presence of their culture might become as fragile as the aspen carvings they've left behind. As more Basques assimilate, their satellite culture can only remain visible in Wyoming if it's kept alive by the new generations of Basques living thousands of miles from their homeland. <laughs> Ta 